That's for a six o'clock session. So the session that was formerly programmed in the Economist Derby Hall has been moved to this venue. That is Kiz Kiz Kijar Hall with Kapil Sibal and Ashok Chakradar, introduced by S. Nirupam. That, that session will now be held here at six o'clock. Please can I remind you one more time to turn off your mobile phones. This session, Kashmir, Kashmir, is presented by Goldman Sachs. It's part of the Goldman Sachs Public Affairs Series. And now let's give a very warm hand to Basharat Peer, MJ Akbar, Mirza Wahid, Natasha Kal, Rahul Pandita, and Swatan Dasgupta. Did she say my name? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a list of the uh, everyone's names? Uh, Since I'm bound to make a mistake, <laughs> no, uh, with I had the name or something. Well, I'll introduce them and I'll give it to you. Then. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, I know all of them. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> uh, I welcome you all uh, on this session, uh, which will debate uh, what I call the pain and politics of Kashmir. Uh, it's a session called Kashmir, Kashmir, uh, because in Kashmir's case, uh, you know, you have to say it twice over one. Apparently, is not enough. We have a distinguished panel of uh, guests here, and I begin from my extreme left. Uh, we have Shopandas Gupta, uh, who is a senior journalist and a columnist. Uh, on his right is uh, Mirza Wahid. He works for the Urdu service of the BBC. And his uh, novel, it's a novel called The Collaborator. It will be, uh, it's being launched now. It will be out in the market, I think, by next month uh, by Penguin. Uh, on his right is Mr. M.J. Akbar. Uh, I think he needs no introduction. Uh, right now, he is the editor-in-chief of the India Today. And on his right is uh, uh, Natasha Call. She's a writer and a scholar. Uh, she has a doctorate in econ economics and philosophy, I believe. And my name is Rahul Pandita. I work for the Open Magazine. I'm a Delhi-based journalist. On my right is uh, uh, my dear friend Basharat Peer. He is a journalist and the author of uh, critically acclaimed Curfewed Nights, a memoir of growing up in Kashmir. Before I um, give the, uh, leave the dais open for discussions, and uh, Mr. Akbar is going to moderate this discussion, uh, I would like to tell a small anecdote, which, will, which I hope will set the momentum uh, for this discussion. Uh, you know, I'm a Kashmiri myself, and uh, uh, I've, I've lived in Kashmir till I was 14 years old. Uh, before the exile began. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Kashmiri Pandit. Um, I had a cousin whose name was Ravi and his uh, best friend was this man called Latif Lone. Uh, now Latif Lone was a color, very colorful man and uh, he ran this small cosmetic shop uh, in our locality, a shop uh, that uh, went by the name of Bombay Beauties. Uh, his only job in the world was to uh, uh, put uh, nice, delicate bangles in the wrists of uh, delicate girls. And he's also a Rafi fan. And uh, no matter what time of uh, uh, the day you would meet him, there's always this uh, uh, Rafi song on his lips, uh, which goes uh, uh, like this, Tum mujhe hiyo bulana paoge. And I was surprised, it's a uh, coincidence that um, in Wahid's book, uh, The Collaborator, uh, there's this character called Hussain whose favorite song is also Tum Mujhe Yumbulana Paoge. Um, 
the weather is very harsh uh, in Kashmir in the winters and uh, as ever Doordarshan used to be very insipid and uh, we used to have these antennas uh, through which we caught uh, PTV. So as um, many times this uh, weather would uh, play a truant and um, the antenna would go haywire and at such a time Latif loan was in demand. So he would uh, be recalled by my family, uh, by my cousin's family. He would climb that uh, rooftop, uh, look at east and west as if offering a namaz. And uh, my mother and every other relative would be uh, standing downstairs, uh, praying to God, uh, whichever they remembered. And my grandfather, who was an atheist, he would, uh, he would say, uh, no, the Hindu gods, gods cannot uh, save him. So you have to read <coughs> Kalma. And he would start reading Kalma, which he had uh, memorized long time back in 1947, when he had to flee Baramula from the marauding tribesmen uh, in 1947. In late 80s, however, uh, we would see very little of Latif Lone. And I remember him uh, one day, uh, uh, I was outside a vegetable shop, and I remember him, uh, he was holding a, uh, a, a sheet in his hand, collecting a donation for the local mosque. And I couldn't help but notice that there was this uh, transistor going on there on which a Rafi song played. Uh, but uh, for the first time in my life, I. I saw that his lips were not moving. So later, uh, I think about six months later, uh, the, ex uh, the exodus began and the Kashmiri Pandits, about 300,000 of them had to flee. And uh, uh, I think a few months later, I was in Jammu uh, in exile, a young boy of 14 years old. And we read this uh, small piece of news. It was a headline in the <coughs> daily newspapers saying dreaded militant Latif Loan shot dead. So apparently he had uh, crossed through the border when we wouldn't see him there. And uh, one fine morning he was standing outside his cosmetic shops, cosmetic shop, and he was, uh, uh, he was killed in an encounter with the security forces. And many uh, years later, my cousin, whose, na whose name was Ravi, he was a doctorate in botany, uh, he was dragged out of the bus uh, by militants along with two other uh, men. He was a professor of botany and shot dead. So I think uh, that uh, encapsulates uh, the whole pain uh, and tragedy of Kashmir. Uh, I would request Mr. Akbar to kindly moderate the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. Kashmir is not a subject that has often lent itself to moderation. But, uh, <laughs> we shall try and do our best. Uh, my opening request will be to the other panelists. Please be moderate in your the time you take, because we have we have an hour. We have a specific uh, calendar schedule to keep to, and uh, it would be a shame if some of the later panelists uh, were denied there. Is that promptly at five to six we're going to be thrown out? Uh, just on an introductory note. Uh, you mentioned Kashmir. We, are we discussing Kashmir? Are we discussing Kashmir Square? Kashmir, Kashmir has a sort of uh, tendency to be very emotional, and sometimes I believe emotion can come in the way of a proper, both of the understanding of the roots of the problem, the history of the problem, the future of the problem, and the management of the problem. Uh, briefly, since I have to be moderate myself <laughs> before I can give anyone advice. You mentioned a Rafi song. Yeah. Now, uh, just now my phone went off and I recall that there's another Rafi song on my phone. It seems to me very apt for the evening. It's a song from, uh, I think, Hamdono. Uh, the two lines which may be uh, relevant to remember, Jo mil gaya, Usi ko mukaddar samaj gaya, jo kho gaya mein usko bhulata chala gaya. Right? Maybe in these lines there might be a solution for the future. But to begin, let me ask Basharat to uh, start the session with his opening observations. Hopefully there will be more than one viewpoint. Uh, everyone here is linked to Kashmir in some way or the other. My mother was a Kashmiri. Shopan is the only one 
who is for this evening defined as an intellectual Kashmir. <laughs> we keep you in our. Uh, Bashar, should we correct? Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Akbar. As, as Mr. Akbar said, that, you know, it's, it's such a broad topic, and one can sort of go on describing anecdote upon anecdote, horror upon competing horror. And I'm honestly tired of that. So the question today, and I, I, was, I was just talking to my family or friends back home, is that the past summer has been rather bloody in Kashmir. I mean, it's, it's well known, especially to people who follow current events in South Asia, was this Intifada-style uprising with teenagers coming out on the, stone, uh, on the, on the streets with stones and, and, the, and the police and the forces trying to curb that. And we ended up with really a bloody season with, with more than 100 people dead, and which also led to a range of political developments how significant they were, we are, we are still trying to process that. I mean, there was a set of interlocutors that was appointed. There was a lot of debate about Armed Forces Special Powers Act, about talk about demilitarization and what might be possible. So I think at the moment what's happening there is that the government is very insecure, fearing that there might be protests when the snows melt in March and April. And there's a massive police crackdown going on. And, you know, there's more than, like, 2,000 boys in, you know, in the, from the ages of 15 to 25 who have been arrested under these. There's a law called Public Safety Act. You can detain anyone for two years under that law in Kashmir, and there's no bail for that. And if you're released on bail, you can, uh, a local police officer can you know, apply that law again. And so we are at this moment when, at one hand, police is using, and troops are using the kind of tactics they have always used to sort of quieten Kashmir. But I, I'm, I'm worried about it, and it's a fair, not just as a, as a journalist, but also as, a, as someone who, who comes from that place, is that what is, what is the immediate future going to hold, or whether we would see any, any, any potential seriousness on part of you know, be it the Indian government or their relationships with the Pakistani government. Is, is there a way out? Is, is there something that could, that could happen? Could there be a serious move? I mean, everyone can pile up a list of horrors. I don't think that's going to help us anymore. I'm, I'm worried about the future because there's another generation. These were our cousin, you know, I mean, I used to carry him around when he was a baby. And he is 17 now. I mean, people used to be worried about my generation when the 90s happened. I mean, it's already my generation is worried about another generation being lost. And I think I would turn to Mr. Akbar on, the, on that note. I mean, that, that's really a concern at the moment. What does the future hold? Uh, Kashmir, uh, there are two levels of the problem. One is the nature of its political relationships with the subcontinent. And number two is what Bashara just mentioned and described in some detail, which is the behavior of the Indian state. When it comes to excesses by the Indian state, whether it is against Kashmiris, Nagaland, Northeast, Naxalites, whoever, I think civil society in this country is strong enough to rise and uh, demand that these excesses not only be stopped but be reversed, but also, if possible, there shall be accountability. But when you come to a more tricky question, which is, is the Kashmir demand a demand for human rights or is it a demand for secession? And if it is a demand for secession, then the Indian state and the Indian people will look upon it with a very different, with, with, with a very different uh, pair of binoculars. And I think this is where we need to, if we are going to be honest, accept that will a secessionist movement, particularly a secessionist movement, which was quasi-theocratic, certainly Mr. Jilani represents a theocracy, which has as its elements an ethnic component. We've seen the consequences of a two-nation theory. Is it possible to have a three-nation theory and then stop at that in the subcontinent? Can Pakistan survive the Baluchistan civil war? Or will a state be able to protect its integrity irrespective of what 
might be what might have happened in the past. And I hope on some of these issues also we begin to debate and shed light. Shall we ask Natasha, maybe you would like? My take on this. Um, I'm glad we began with songs because uh, if you Google for Kashmir, one of the first things you find is that Kashmir is a Led Zeppelin song. And this morning, this afternoon, thinking about it, I thought, you know, it should have been a Queen song, I Want to Break Free, instead of, you know, the Led Zeppelin song. Um, Kashmir is complicated. It's not simple, and what the world knows about it, what people in India know about it, it's, um, it's grossly simplified into an India versus Pakistan issue or a Hindu versus Muslim issue, neither of which it is. Kashmir is not an India versus Pakistan issue, although for domestic compulsions of politics, people talk about it as that. You have to understand that what's happening at this point in Kashmir is that India is, most Indians are ignorant of the kinds of excesses happening there. Last summer alone, um, you know, there was an average of one teenager uh, dying a day, uh, you know, at, with, with bullets. And all they had, some of them had stones in their hands. Others were just, you know, going out to buy chicken or just caught in the crossfire or things like that. And over the last few decades, we've seen, six, you know, even by official count, something like 60,000 people have died uh, in the valley. Uh, there have been 10,000 people or upwards who have, uh, you know, gone missing. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are displaced. There are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of widows. I mean, the numbers are crazy. So, and on top of that, there are laws such as, you know, Bashar just mentioned the Public Safety Act or the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which allow uh, security forces to actually just detain or shoot or impose curfew and with, with impunity. So um, most average Indians have no idea when they say Dood mangoge to khir denge, Kashmir mangoge to cheer denge, which means if you want milk, I'll give you khir, which is a dessert. If you want Kashmir, I'll tear you apart. It's that kind of horrible nationalist rhetoric. And what's it, what it's created is that it's created this absence in people's imagination, both in the valley of the Kashmiri Hindus who, who were forced to flee in the late 80s, and also of the people outside Kashmir who, you know, who see Kashmir only in terms of the Muslim majority population and, and not as Kashmiris, but as Hindus or Muslims. So all of this is, I mean, so the tragedy in terms of just sheer numbers is atrocious. And on top of that, there's this idea that bureaucrats at the center in, in Delhi, you know, they have historically operated on this kind of imperial mindset whereby they sit at the center, patronize local elites, rival elites if need be, and there's this kind of what I call the Mandarin Machiavelli interaction. You know, the bureaucrat at the center who has to make the policy but doesn't have a clue about what's on, going on in the ground, and the people in Kashmir who are the local elites who claim to represent the people there uh, whether, they, whether they actually do or not. And that's the level at which the interaction happens between two centers of power, which does not involve the people in India who do not know about what's going on in Kashmir, does not involve the people in Kashmir because they are not represented. So everyone says, what do the Kashmiris want? I mean, what do the Kashmiris want? And Kashmiris have gone hoarse screaming, you know, hum kya chahte azadi, what do we want? Freedom. And th what that freedom means is is the ability to kind of disaggregate that and see freedom to and freedom from. We want freedom from oppression so that people have in a democracy the right to assembly, which people in Kashmir don't. The right to protest, which people in Kashmir don't. So if there's no electricity, people cannot get together and say, you know, we want electricity. The right to have fair elections. I mean, uh, you know, we see this kind of radical Islam, uh, Islam, you know, and, and Islamophobia in the world today. But go back to 1987 when the elections in Kashmir were massively rigged, and because of that, you know, that therein lie the roots of a lot of that's happening. And you know, and absolutely, there's, for the last 20 years, there have been people in Kashmir, young men and young women, who have lived their daily lives under humiliation, strip and search, torture, missing, disappeared relatives. It's I mean, that's, what's the moral force of India and Kashmir? It's, you know, what, what is the idea of India and Kashmir? I want to a little thing to add to that. Um, you know, I, sometimes I'm not uh, really sure whether it's about, uh, uh, it's more of New Delhi's ignorance or the arrogance of it. I was, uh, 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 you know, I was talking to this young IPS officer from Kashmir and um, he had recently been summoned to uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs. And um, uh, there this uh, uh, lady uh, met him, who was supposedly the head of the Kashmir division. And uh, in the process of uh, conversation, she asked him a question, which he was very baffled with. Uh, uh, she said, uh, why can't we, uh, sir, tell me one thing, why can't we just uh, shut the gates so that uh, infiltration does not happen? 
apparently, uh, I think she had this uh, idea of uh, Vaga border kind of thing where, you know, the gates uh, close and then the infiltration stops. But having said that, you know, I go to Kashmir, uh, uh, I think, four or five times a year, uh, mainly because of professional reasons. I and I met, uh, meet uh, a lot of these young men, you know, in their 19s, uh, 20s, early 20s, who are stone pelters also. And I'm sometimes amazed because, you know, as a Kashmiri, I work in Kashmir on different levels. Uh, there are people who know that I'm a Kashmiri. There are people who don't know I'm a Kashmiri, and I uh, like it that way because then I get to, uh, you know, uh, uh, read into it and stuff. I'm amazed at the kind of, uh, uh, you know, how immune the youngsters have become to violence. I was traveling with this uh, bunch of young kids uh, in, in a car, and they're talking to each other about uh, incidents of stone pelting. And they were so normal about uh, violence. One was talking to the other, he said, you know how uh, uh, Irfan, uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, you know, a lati was uh, put on his head and ho his whole brain came out. And I got uh, talking to this young man and I said, uh, he was wearing this fancy shoes, uh, a pair of shoes, and I said, uh, where did you get this from? So he said, uh, you know, I, I have a, I'm an MBA graduate, uh, I have a, a master's. And uh, I got these shoes from Noida. Uh, now, this is a young, typical man who has a girlfriend uh, who likes to go with his girlfriend in a shikara and ha maybe have a can of beer. But I'm not sure whether that's possible um, in, uh, in, in an Azad Kashmir or uh, under someone like Mr. Gilani or uh, with Pakistan, looking at the kind of uh, uh, the mess Pakistan is in right now. Right. And that, uh, in fact, brings us to a very important uh, aspect of the whole problem, uh, which I hope, again, somebody will address, that I, in my view that the challenge before the subcontinent is really the challenge of modernity. Which nation state can become a modern nation state? And in my view, at least, a modern nation is defined by four non-negotiable principles. Number one, it must be a democracy, and not an occasional democracy. Number two, it must be secular, and not just leave space for some aspects of secularism. Number three, there must be gender equality. If there is no gender equality, you cannot be a modern nation. And, and number four, there must be economic equity. There's nothing called economic equality. But if you do not have equity, if every Indian does not feel that he is part of the rising economy of India, then we are not a modern nation. I, as an Indian, am very proud to say that we succeed on three, the first three. But on the economic equity part, we still lag behind. And as long as there's a Naxalite crying out because he's hungry, we cannot call ourselves a modern nation. So, I think this is really one of the things a lot of Kashmiris, I think, will have to choose whether they want to be with a modern template or with an idea which, at least in my view, doesn't match or doesn't uh, permit these things. Now, uh, I think we do have to make a point. Secessionism can be a very romantic idea. And the mistakes of a state can also become cause for a lot of legitimate anger. But if rigging an election was sufficient reason for secession, then I imagine Pakistan would be in uh, about 50 different countries by now. <laughs> we have to understand, again, that please do not underestimate the nationalism of either India or Pakistan. Pakistan is not going to, you know, whoever thinks suddenly split apart and, you know, despair. Pakistani nationalism and its institutions will hold the country against the threats to Pakistan nationalism. Similarly, the Indian state and the institutions of the Indian state, the democratic institutions of the Indian state, will hold the country against any threats. And please, 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 do not punish India for the sins of Indians. I think, uh, why don't we... <laughs> uh, 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 could be a bit a little nervous. I've never spoken in front of such a large crowd. This is Mirza. Mirza, I just to reintroduce him. He's in BBC and of course an author, which is why he's here. So mostly I read from a novel to my wife, and she's beginning to get bored uh, <laughs> with it now. I was born in Kashmir, and I grew up there. And uh, I left in uh, my le late teenage, uh, basically because I didn't want to sort of get killed at such a young age. Uh, 
the ostensible reason was education, but my parents were very happy that uh, you get away because you see dead bodies every day, uh, mostly young people. Uh, now I live elsewhere and I sort of, you know, I look at Kashmir and I follow Kashmir and I feel and live Kashmir from distant shores. Um, I'm a journalist by day, I follow the story as well. Um, and I also follow the fortunes, or I should say misfortunes, of my family and friends. My father, my mother, my sisters, uh, they live in Kashmir. Um, and you basically run the phones and, and Skype and uh, other things, uh, a bit too much sometimes. In the last summer, this, this bloody summer Basharat uh, talked about, uh, I was on the phone every day, uh, in fact, more than once a day. And there was this evening when I spoke to my father. My father is getting old. He's a retired uh, tourist sort of uh, person. He used to work in tourism. And uh, I was trying to be a son from this distant place and wanted to know about stocks in the house because we had this curfew for weeks and weeks and weeks where you're never allowed to go out, you're not allowed to buy medicines. And we found ourselves talking about milk, uh, a very small thing. And he said, we've got stuff and, you know, we've got stocks. Kashmiris hold a lot of rice, we eat a lot of rice. Uh, so we had plenty of rice, uh, but there was no milk. And my sister's children live in the family. So he had to go out at night uh, to find milk. Uh, uh, Kashmiris have learned to live uh, with sieges and curfews and everything. The arrangement was the local milkman would uh, call into the neighborhood and uh, fix a milk collection rendezvous. Uh, at 12 at night, uh, secretly I must add. Um, and then people would sort of queue up at night uh, with these pails to collect milk. And my father was quite dignified about it actually and he wasn't even bitter. He said, you know, this is what happens here. We carry on and we sort of live our lives and everything. But it disturbed me quite a bit because it also made me feel sort of uh, guilty. And, uh, and then you get thinking and, and then you sort of talk about, so what is happening in Kashmir, where you're from and where you grew up? And the narrative that often emerges is of complete, utter powerlessness of people, of all Kashmiris, I must add. They have no power. They have, they have very little rights. Uh, Natasha referred to that a bit. And, you know, basically all we do is throw stones for you, which you get killed on the streets. Or you write books for you, which you get called to this panel. And, uh, you know, so then, then the question that is then how do we get, how did we get here? What has happened? Why are we in this situation after 22 years of unrest and, and uprising? And very often you come to a rather simple conclusion. It may sound naive sometimes and, and novelists are often accused of being naive. It's a very simple situation. India and Pakistan haven't done much. They are not doing anything to address this very, very important issue. I slightly disagree with Natasha that it is, it is an India-Pakistan problem. Yes, it's a Kashmiri problem at heart, at core, but it is between India and Pakistan as well. Sure. We wouldn't be here otherwise. And uh, I am sorry, I mean, the, the, the prospects are quite bleak, you know. They're not talking, and that is all they need to do. They're not talking, they're very bleak. And the, the future scenarios are quite scary. Uh, Bashar has referred to it. Uh, I talk to people, I talk to my young cousins in Kashmir. They're a very, very angry lot. They have no hopes for the future. Those who get out, they do get out and they study to university, in universities in India and abroad. But the people who stay there, they are very angry. And unless and until we address those people, unless in India Pakistan, they come together and, and talk and, and sort of, you know, uh, and they have to leave their respective maximalist, I don't like the word, uh, stances and, and talk uh, meaningfully, sincerely, purposefully and try and give Kashmir's a break, seriously. We're kind of, you know, tired of getting killed and sort of being curfewed day and night. Uh, young people with no future. Uh, I'll, I'll end that for now. I think it was a long answer. Sorry. No, no, perfectly <laughs> legitimate and genuinely heartfelt and uh, uh, absolutely right. And I, you know, one of the points that uh, Mr. made was very important. We can't really uh, ignore the fact that it is a India pakistan problem. And um, the, one of the things, of course, we want to get technical and legal about it is that the India Independence Act, through which we became Dominion states, we didn't actually become free on 15th and 14th August. We, only, we merely became Dominions, but it's a carefully hidden secret. And the, uh, there was no provision for a third country. You had to join either India or Pakistan. 
So the idea of independence uh, is really, I think, in reality, a non-starter with both nations. With both nations. The only thing India and Pakistan agree on uh, over Kashmir is that there won't be independence. After that, we'll see. So, well, uh, <laughs> no, I, what I thought was that, you know, we, we're actually uh, doing. We'll get the uh, shop on a chance to speak. And then I think when the questions come, you can, you, you know, you keep the question in relevant and give whatever answer you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have very many anecdotes to offer, except a rather flippant one, which is that when an English friend of mine heard that I'm speaking in a seminar called Kashmir Kashmir, he said, oh, I didn't know you spoke about fashion. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a seminar which uh, Tarun Tejpal had organized in uh, London on Indo Park. And he made the observation that Indo Park is essentially a Punjab problem. It's a Punjabi problem. Now, that's a wonderful, if somewhat facile, one liner. But I think. Anybody who went to the seminar, uh, the session on 1857, which we had earlier in the morning, would have been struck by various different <laughs> forms of narratives which emerged from that seminar. You had Willie Dalrymple talking about a distinctly Delhi narrative. You had Mohammed Faruqi talking about a very Awad perspective. And you had Rinal Pandey who gave the views of two itinerant Brahmins who were there in Jhansi and Kanpur, etc. Likewise, in the case of Kashmir, I think there are very, very different narratives at work. There is what I call the dominant narrative, which I think we've been exposed to today. And if any of you haven't read uh, Mirza Wahid's book, The Collaborator, which I happen to have got hold of last evening, and I just read two chapters, and I think that's a very, very telling, very moving story about a ghost village on the LOC, mainly dominated by Gujars, who have disappeared now. And it's, it's a very moving story. And I think during the, what Basharat called the Intifada, very romantically. Uh, oh, it's a description. Uh, it's a there's description. No, there's not much romance uh, when you get head in your head with a stick. Trust me. There's no romance to that. No, no, you drew a story. No, I do not romanticize violence. I've seen it up close. Called the Intifada. Now, I think we've read a lot of very emotional literature centered on that. Uh, we've also read off late some literature coming out. And I think the, the, this was an issue which we were in complete denial about for about 21 years. That is the exodus of the pundits from the valley. I recall in the 1990s, in a largely liberal left dominated media, how difficult it was to even mention the plight of the pundits without being told, oh, but they left voluntarily. They were part of a state design. People don't leave houses voluntarily. We've also read narratives from Pakistan. We've also read human rights narratives, international narratives. There is, of course, one other narrative which doesn't seem to have made that much of an impression here. And I think as the token non-Kashmiri, may I say there is something which can be called an Indian narrative, which is, exists in a larger sense. And I think it's got to do the question of Kashmir. It has all these dimensions, and I'm not denying it, and I'm not denying any of its intent. But it's also linked to the idea of India, which Akbar alluded to, the four basic tenets of what constitutes a modern state. But there is a fifth element, which is, it's a very old-fashioned idea, which is, that the nation somehow is bigger than the sum of all its parts. And that's a very, very important idea of what, a, why people are willing to address the question of human rights in Kashmir, 
people are willing to address the question of autonomy in Kashmir, but people are not willing to entertain the notion of secession in Kashmir. Right. Uh, because the space no, of what you. constitutes India, both as a nation state and as an idea, as a civilizational idea, has over the centuries getting truncated in very ways. And the truncation is not merely a geographical one, it's also an emotional one. It's an emotional one because the more you truncate India, the more insular it becomes, the more monochromatic it becomes. And that, to my mind, is very important. Why it's possible to address Kashmir in terms of autonomy, after all, Historically, India always never had one form of government. It's possible to have multiple forms of government within one state, within one flag. And perhaps if the debate on Kashmir was to address the specificities and reject the idea of separateness in a nation state sort of way, I think it would be perhaps far more rewarding. I'll just leave it at that. Good. We've crossed the spectrum. I'm seeing from my left uh, sort of uh, signs that it's time to wind up and leave the floor open for questions, which I shall do. But uh, I think Nitisha was very insistent that she wanted two minutes. So, uh, Basharat, if you have to say, you can take uh, it. No, actually, I, no, I, take it in I had a of the way, question. No, no, I mean, ah, because Swapan did talk about an important point. No, um, we, and then I want to talk to him about that uh, data. Definitely. Definitely. Certainly. Quickly, please, a minute if you can manage it. Okay. Tell me when the minute is over. Um, uh, uh, Gilani, who, who was being referred to here, uh, did say at the seminar on, on Kashmir in Delhi, where uh, Arundhati Roy was later charged with sedition, um, that independent Kashmir would not ban alcohol. Now understand, I'm not saying Kashmir should be independent. I, am, I have no right to speak for a whole lot of people. I'm just saying that people should have the right to decide for themselves if they are denied dignity and denied the recognition of their identity. I'm not saying, it's, it's a point about justice. It's not a point that you know Kashmir should secede. It's about recognizing what Kashmiris want um, and not using the euphemisms of you know the democracy gender equality and all of that uh, to, to say that I mean I agree that that is all a very important part of nationhood but I think nations exist to serve their populations and if they don't do that and you know you have a, a military occupation in Kashmir it's not the same as Tamil Nadu or elsewhere or Maharashtra there's you know 500,000 upwards troops if you have a gun pointed at you uh, that's nowhere else in India. Nowhere else is the military going out to quell dissent. So the, the, that's something very specific and different, that it's the fact that it's under occupation. And that the Kashmiri people have been bargained into nationhood. Kashmir is not India, it's not Pakistan, it's not China. I mean, if we're talking about borders.